No, it's being recorded. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So notice the following, that since we have this, that the four velocity is normalized in this sense. So if I take the derivative of this equation, this is zero and g mu nu, I'm, I'm working Today, unless I say otherwise, I'm working in initial coordinates. So, because in that, in this u mu and a mu, they all remain vectors. So initial coordinates, g mu nu components are constants. So they just come out and you get this. Can everyone please mute their mics? Unless you have to say something. So again, now it's a standard trick. K, because mu nu, G is uh, symmetric, I can replace mu by nu in the second equation. So let me just do it once for fun. Replace nu by mu and mu by nu. Since it's a summed index, it doesn't change anything. But now I use the symmetry of g mu nu in the second equation. nu mu can be extended with mu nu because g is symmetric. So all it's saying is two times g mu nu u mu d u mu nu d u mu over d tau, which is just the definition of a mu, a nu is zero. That means this scalar product is zero. So in other words, you can say that the acceleration vector, the way we have defined for vector is automatically orthogonal to the four velocity. So four acceleration is orthogonal to four velocity. So let us see what are its different components of this four uh, acceleration vector. How would we interpret it in a particular frame? So first of all, because of this equation, if I go to an, in an MCRF, So what's an MCRF? Just a reminder again, you have some uh, one line. Kisi bhi point pe agar tangent vectors ka dekhe, to there is some tangent vector. And since it's a, a time-like one line, I will have, I can extend it and I will have an observer whose word line is just by, is drawn by extending this tangent vector. Okay, so someone, because, uh, so in other words, this since this is a time-like uh, uh, word line, so at every point, the, uh, its speed of the particle over here in any frame is less than speed of light. So that means, so in your starting frame, for example, it's less than speed of light, then there will be an observer which is moving with the same speed at this point as this particle. At any point you can consider, there would be another observer which is moving with same speed as the speed of this particle. So at any point you can go to that frame which moves at the same speed 
as this object. So in that frame, this object is stationary. And we had discovered that in MCRF, the components of the four velocity are simply this. Because in an MCRF, u mu are just dx mu. And in an MCRF, tau is equal to t. So dt over dt and dx over dt, this is one. And all of these guys are zero because there is no speed of this particle in this particular frame. So then the MCRF u mu looks like this. But that would mean using this equation, I have to have Uh, is zero. Now u vector in the MCRF has all components zero. So this thing is automatically zero. And u naught is one. So I have to put a naught to zero to get a zero on the right hand side. So this means in an MCRF a vector has this form. Its timeline component is zero. Now, what would be then, this is an MCRF. If we go back to our original frame, so we have some original frame, let's call it our frame. And this particle is moving in, we are drawing its word line in this frame. So I want to know if a mu vector has this component in MCRF, what would be the components in my frame? So I just come back to, at this point, particle is moving, this particle has an instantaneous velocity V in my frame. So I just come back from this frame to my frame. So from this frame perspective, we are moving at the speed minus V in the other direction. So you just apply Lorentz transformation with speed with velocity minus V to come back to to the original frame where this particles instantaneous velocity velocity is v so if i just do that all i'm doing is applying the lorentz transformation so my original frame which is i'm writing as dash but i'll then remove the dash because I have written MCRF components without dash like this. Is this. This is just the Lorentz transformation. V times A naught plus A. Now, since a naught in MCRF was zero, so I can put that equal to zero over here. And my a naught would be v dot a over one minus v square. And a dash would be a over one minus v square. Now let's look at what is this a. A is just the components, these components, the u mu over d tau uh, is get three components. 
which is just dx over d tau square. Okay, aapke paas ye diya hua aur isme jo spatial components hai uska main double derivative with respect to tau le raha hu. But in MCRF tau is equal to t. So this means a is just dt square which is just acceleration ordinary acceleration in mcrf so a is just ordinary acceleration in a frame where this particle is instantaneously at rest first derivative dx by dt is zero but the second derivative is not it has some value of a so that is this a dash so then i can say ke isko main na actually isko main ek naam de deta hu let me call it g so that i can remove these a dashes over here so this means ke jo hai a hai in my frame would be v dash g over 1 minus v square and uh, sorry a not and a would be g over 1 minus v square Uh, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, so you have written uh, written down um, that first derivative zero, but second derivative zero is not there in MCRF. Uh -huh. uh, mathematically, that does not. I don't understand. I mean, how how are we? Uh, can you explain that? Yeah. I mean, this is no big deal. Like, if you look at the curve. अब मैं कोई ये नहीं बना रहा स्पेस टाइम डायग्राम नहीं बना रहा कि मैं कोई भी अगर मेरे पास ये कोई चीज है टी एक्स अगर मेरे पास ऐसे है यहाँ पे स्पीड बढ़ रही है और यहाँ काम हो रही है तो यहाँ पे एक बीच में आपके पास एक जगह आएगी जहाँ पे फर्स्ट डेरिवेटिव जीरो है यू हैव अ कस्प ऑफ अदर राइट मगर सेकेंड डेरीवेटिव इज नॉट जीरो यू हैव अट ऑफ चेंज जीरो So dx over dt is zero, but the second derivative doesn't have to be, because the rate of change, of rate of change, if it was zero, then it will not change at all at the next instant as well. Is it clear? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. I mean, if you have a function, its rate of change. So, like th exactly this thing. Yeah, exactly this thing. at some point its rate of change is zero because it's flat over here but as if, if you have to move away from here that means the rate of change of the rate of change is not zero so it's like for example suppose a car is moving towards you with a certain speed at the start and it has a deceleration it has a acceleration pointed away from you that means iski jo velocity hai aapki taraf wo point to point kam ho rahi hai कम होती जा रही है फाइनली इट विल कम टू अरेस्ट एंड देन स्टार्ट मूविंग बैक एंड इट्स ऑल ऑफ दिस इज हैपनिंग एट कांस्टेंट स्पीड वेल वेल एक्चुअली वी हैव अ मच इजी एग्जांपल थ्रो अ स्टोन अपवर्ड्स राइट यू स्टो इट विद सर्टेन स्पीड v एंड यू हैव अ कांस्टेंट एक्सेलरेशन g पॉइंटिंग डाउनवर्ड्स सो एट ईच इंस्टेंट यू कीप टेकिंग ऑफ द स्पीड द वेलोसिटी the velocity keep going down at a constant rate g dv over dt is g so when you keep doing it at some point your velocity becomes zero this stone stops 
but then comes back. And it happens continuously, obviously. So what you find that at this point, the first derivative of position is zero, speed is zero, but acceleration is not. Acceleration is constantly G. So is it clear? Uh, that's clear. Uh, yes, conceptually, just the interpretation is so much more clear. But the first derivative is equal to zero. Then uh, no, I don't know why you're getting confused with it. That's a very common that's situation. Usually... That's a very common situation that you have first derivative is zero, but the second is not. I don't know why I like mathematically. Because because cusp pe um uh cusp pe jo derivative exists nahi karta what what we learn in calculus right? Nahi, ye kab hua ki derivative exists nahi karta. I mean, when you have a extremum, when you find an extremum of a function, a maximum value or minimum value, what do you look for? You put the derivative equal to zero. That means you have a cusp, and then you check the second derivative. If it's positive, mm -hmm. oh, yeah, 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 you have this, yeah, yeah. this situation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If it's yeah, yeah, negative, yeah. you have this situation. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, now can you uh, mute your mic, please? Okay, thank you. So in our frame, whatever this uh, vector, this acceleration four vector represents, its zeroth component would be this, and its uh, space, uh, uh, space-like component would be this. Where uh, g is the acceleration in the MCLF. Uh, maybe I should g gets people confused with uh, acceleration due to gravity. Let me use some other symbol. Hmm. What should I? Maybe I should put a with some. M. Okay. So that means uh, this is not exactly the three components. The, the, the zeroth component of it is some junk like this, but the spatial components which you were expecting it to be equal to the acceleration. Uh, this doesn't have to be ex even acceleration in uh, our frame. It's this thing, that acceleration in the MCRF divided by one minus V square, uh, where V is uh, equal to, uh, V is, the, is, is instantaneous speed. Now, in our frame, in, in, their, in, in the MCRF, it was just this. In our frame, this would be the same thing if our T's matched, but our T's do not match. That's the issue. So if I compute this uh, with the MCLF time, then it's fine. But if I compute with uh, our, with tau, then it's different. In our A, it's different. Now, what I can do uh, I if I do this a mu, a mu, compute its uh, magnitude. I know that this is independent of frame. So I can compute it in an MCRF. In MCRF, A0, 0, is 0. This is 0. You, all you get is this product. Which is a m 
Um, so the magnitude of this a mu, a mu, you can compute by is just equal to the magnitude of agamesco acceleration kadu. This is just acceleration ka mod square in MCLF. Now, I want to write some kind of generalization of the Newton's law. So, and there's some external force. So since no, I do not have a constant line, so it's changing. So I just put it equal to something. As we discussed, that when you're considering external forces not given by some formula, this is pretty much vacuous. So it is going to be same thing over here. I have some acceleration. My uh, uh, tangent vectors are not constants. So I just scale them with M as I do it in Newton's law. And whatever I get, I say that is equal to some external force. It's completely vacuous. But at least this uh, similarity to Newton's second law will help us in interpreting it in some way. So let's interpreting our, the things we have, we had defined previously momenta, it will help us interpreting them. Uh, so let me write it this way. D tau. And we had called u mu as we have defined this when we scale the four velocity with m, some constant, which we were calling the rest mass then this thing was called the four momentum. So again, I can write this as d by d tau of the four momentum. So over here, you have four equations for each component, but they are not all independent because we know that force, which is the scaling of acceleration. This is equal to, is equal to zero. So that means those equations are related and you have this thing well, is zero or this combination is equal to this. Now, taking this, I can write, and using this, I can write F dot U is D P not over D tau times U not, but this is equal to D P not over D tau in any frame U not is just equal to one minus V square. Remember, in any in our in any frame where the particles uh, instantaneous velocity is v for any one line if the particles at this point in our frame particles instantaneous velocity is v then the u vector the four vector will have components v square so you have this and so I can replace these components here as well. F dot V over one minus V square. 
is dp naught over d tau. So these two cancel and I get f dot v is equal to dp naught. Now let me instead of, uh, because I'm now want to interpret it, what I will see, how I will interpret these equations. So instead of proper time, I put the time in my frame, which will be related like this to the proper time of this particle. If the instantaneous velocity of it is V. So then I can write it in the following way. So F was dp over dt d tau, which I replaced by again v square so that means dp and dotted into v over dt dotted into ordinary velocity so this momentum, which is actually not ordinary momentum, is the momentum defined in the relativistic way. We saw it that it's not it's uh, not defined. It's a little bit different. I'll come to that. How is it different? But this is equal to the rate of change of the zeroth component of this four momentum. This dotted. This empty equation which I'm again calling empty equation is saying this. Just by geometry, these relations are, these are connected. But if I come back to my mechanics, now suppose you have no normal mechanics, I am writing it in small piece. Usually we can do this. Uh, Well, before I do the ordinary mechanics, let me give it a particular form. Let me call this P naught as we had done, P naught as E, and this P is the three momentum. Then this DP over DT is called ordinary force. Q, because ordinarily, what we do, we say, my bus here equation with Tina. DT square is force. And if I call m times v, which is m times dx over dt as the momentum, then this equation is saying the rate of change of momentum is equal to force. Again, just uh, one should call, think of it as just uh, uh, definitions. This is the definition of the force. Rate of change of momentum is the force. Because I did nothing. I just took the rate of change of momentum and called it, gave it a name force. But we know that if I give it this name and I have like this, I write the Newton's second law. And now I'm doing ordinary mechanics, just dotted with the V. This side I can write as right, because when I take the derivative. It will hit it twice. It will make it the double derivative. And the next time it will make the other one double derivative. But since they are same, 
So I'll just get it twice. So I have taken care of that by putting a half over here. So that means F dot V is equal to the rate of change of, we called it kinetic energy. But we are assuming that this particle is not feeling any force except for this external force. There's no potential over here. If there's no potential, kinetic energy is all the energy. So this equation says that the force dotted into V is equal to rate of change of energy or d by dt of energy. But force, I gave it a name. I called it, this was just a name for this. So rate of change of momentum dotted into V is the rate of change of energy. So this people, this more or less definitions, people call it uh, work energy relationship. But if you are a little bit more mathematically careful, you realize that most of these things are just definitions, work energy relationship. Which, which says, so this is actually as a uh, work is F dot DX. So it says that the rate of change of, uh, 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 no, not rate of change, the rate of doing work is equal to the changes in energy. Whatever work you do, you that is converted into energy and the rate of change of doing work is the rate of change of energy. But you don't need to go into that terminology. This is just, I derived by my definitions. So this is exactly what I'm getting. Uh, if I want to make a math, this is what I get. I can give now give an interpretation to my uh, terms, which I defined in relativity. So I had this. Uh, what, what was the equation? Yeah. So I have derived this equation. Which looks exactly like that. So rate of change of momentum, I call this as ordinary force. And this is equal to dotted with V, ordinary velocity. This is now the ordinary velocity of this object is equal to the change in energy, the rate of change of energy. So that means I have every right to call this as energy and every right to call this as momentum. Then the interpretation of someone who hasn't heard of relativity, they haven't heard of relativity, they just observe an object, they observe, they will interpret that something like Newton's, Newton's mechanics is going on, or at least they will try to give these definitions to, to get Newton's law. They will be tempted to give these definitions to these quantities which we have already defined to interpret it what's, as uh, something like a Newton's law, because Newton's law is also just definitions. So definitions of ordinary Newton's law, which we had agreed upon, will match with the definitions of these vectors which we have given with this interpretation that P is momentum. But remember, this is not ordinary momentum. This is d tau. So, so this is m over 1 minus v square dx over dt. So that's why uh, they said that in, in relativity, momentum is calculated by multiplying v with the relativistic mass. And similarly, wait, 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 wait. And similarly, energy is just dx naught over d tau, which is just dt over dt, one minus v square. So it's just one over one minus v square times m, sorry. So energy is just 
relativistic mass. So take the uh, all the energy you have. That would be the relativistic mass. Multiply that with the v. That gives you the momentum, relativistic momentum, and then ordinary Newton's theory holds for these external forces. So in in short. If you want to uh, insist that the energy and momentum they remain constant, these are these energy and momentum. But we saw that geometrically they do remain constant if there is nothing externally external force present there, and just that when they are present, what how should we interpret them? I should still insist that uh, this combination is the momentum and this combination is the energy. So, what's the question? So, I just wanted to ask, what uh, what do you mean by an empty equation? You have written in green, mein hai, empty equation. Upper, thoda, I think, green. Mein. Uh -huh. Left, hai. Ah, upper. Yeah. Ha, to ye ra, sir. Empty yeah. Empty equation. Yeah, it's empty equation because all I'm saying is that whatever derivative has, uh, my word line is not constant; it's changing. So, जो भी इसका चेंज हो रहा है उसको मैंने एक नाम ही दिया आई जस्ट गिवन इट अ नेम एफ म्यू सेम इज ट्रू इन क्लासिकल मैकेनिक्स सेकंड लॉ इज एम्प्टी अनलेस यू हैव अ फोर्स फील्ड नाउ लेट अस लुक एट द फॉलोइंग सिचुएशन uh let me consider not application of this equation i won't be applying second law second law is not very useful in relativity anyway only sometimes as i said that if you are considering some external force only then you can write this equation but then you have to then this is basically a definition so it's not really very useful but let me consider some other application of this acceleration for vector i want to consider an object moving with constant acceleration so what would be the my question is what would be the Uh, one line of such an object first of all what do i mean by constant acceleration i cannot take can take the object to have constant acceleration in one frame to agar wo hamare frame mein for example one frame say it's our frame a particle is gaining 10 kilometers per second every second after a finite time it will cross speed of light but we saw before that this seems to be not happening because agar main kisi bhi mcrf mein jaau ye particle move kar raha hai main mcrf mein jaau aur yahan pe main kahun it gain some speed to agle instant mein iski speed zyada ho gayi aur agle instant mein mazid zyada ho gayi mazid zyada ho gayi so we saw that if you keep increasing the speeds the uh velocity addition law was such that you never cross the speed of light so this kind of uh constant acceleration defining this would be inconsistent this won't help us so we can't do that rather how should we define the constant acceleration take it to be Uh, an object that is uniformly accelerated in its instantaneous mcrf and this makes complete sense so what i'm saying is ke फॉर एग्जाम्पल ये रॉकेट है एक रॉकेट है जो कि एक्सेलरेट हो रहा है आप यहां से बैठे देख रहे हैं आई एम सेंग दैट यू कैन नॉट एज्यूम दैट दिस कीप्स एक्सेलरेटिंग एट कॉन्स्टेंट 
velocity, but because in that case it will drive soon uh, cause the speed of light. But suppose this you go to MCLF. This this rocket is moving at constant speed. I go to an MCLF. So this guy at this moment is moving at the same speed as this rocket. So for this guy, this rocket is accelerating at some acceleration g. It goes further. And let's suppose there's a guy inside as well. So it says gain speed. Now this guy is MCLF. This guy is an initial observer. This guy is an initial observer. This frame is not an MCLF of this rocket anymore at this instant. So now there's another observer with whom the speed of the rocket matches. So in this observer's frame, the rocket is moving at constant acceleration. And same one, G. You know, maybe acceleration T. No, I shouldn't say constant, at acceleration G. So every time I check in an MCLF, its acceleration is G. And this is a very well-defined concept because acceleration is not is actually absolute. Acceleration you can feel. Speed you cannot feel. Sitting here, it makes no sense which one has more speed or which one has less speed. If I go to the MCRF of this rocket, this rocket is stationary. You go to MCRF on any rocket, it's always stationary in its MCRF because speed has, and you cannot feel, you cannot tell which frame is better because you cannot feel the speed. But that's not true for acceleration. Acceleration you can feel. So if you are standing here, this rocket is moving, accelerating above, you will feel that you are being pushed downwards. You will feel a force pushing down. Just like the uh, bus discussed, Kiti. You're standing here, the bus accelerates, you are pushed back, you, pu you feel a push. You please open the mic. So you feel a push back. So when you are standing here, the accelerated frames are not like the uh, frame, initial frames. You can feel the push. It's exactly the acceleration you will feel in your knees. And you can tell how much is the acceleration. You can put a scale here and it will tell you how much you press the scale divided by your mass. That's exactly your acceleration. So acceleration is absolute. This guy can define. So if this guy in the, in the rocket all the time feels a constant acceleration, that would be the acceleration. That would be the thing which we will be calling a, a object moving with constant acceleration. We can look at it from another perspective. Okay, when I have small speeds, then this law, Newton's law holds in ordinary, very ordinary sense. Instead of using these momenta, relativistic momenta, only ordinary momenta, if I put them here, Newton's law holds because every speed is small. But when will I have speed, small speeds? When I'm in MCRF, I'm in a frame which moves with same speed as this rocket. So in an MCRF, F is equal to mg holds. So that means G constant force So I will have to burn a certain amount of uh, fuel, push at a certain rate to get this G. After a while, I have sped up. If I want to find out constant acceleration, very easy. Go to the MCRF and then F is equal to MG still holds. And you want to keep G again, same value. So you will have to burn exactly the same amount of fuel. So that means if I define this constant acceleration in this way, that the rocket is doing some motion and every time you go to MCRF, you are, burn, you are applying same force to 
uh, give it a uh, certain acceleration. So that acceleration, which remains constant in an MCRF, would be a very like a useful concept because it tells me that if I have a rocket, which I am constant push, it will produce this kind of acceleration. Or if a person is in there, they will feel exactly the same amount of push downward throughout the journey. Because this guy is an MCRF. His speed, if he is in a frame move with this rocket ke instantaneously, his speed is zero. Hai. So this person who is frame instantaneously set up kar hai, is the same as the MCRF. Or an MCRF or this person has a special feel. Ho rahi hai. That's frame independent. He's just feeling it in his knees. Or after some time, if it keeps feeling the same, in the next instant, he will measure it with respect to the new MCR. So this is something which I will call as a rocket moving with, or any object moving with constant acceleration, that if the acceleration remains uh, constant in an MCRF. Any question? Okay. Uh, sir, can we take a break? Um, Last break. Okay. So let's then take a break of how long? 15 minutes or 20 minutes? 10 minutes. Okay, let's, let's take a 15 yeah. minutes break. Okay. We meet back at 6.15. Yeah, thank you. So let's come back. So, quick question here is concept. Ke mein. Uh, I'm here, but I do not have any questions. Mm -hmm.
so uh, is there any question can you do a constant acceleration kind of concept uh, How do I get rid of this? Okay. So are people here? Yes, sir. Quick question is by the constant question here. Sir. Okay, so I want to find the void line of such a trajectory, which will give me some particle which is moving at constant acceleration, defined this way. That that particle feels constantly uh, an exact same push on it. At every instant, the particle interprets that there is a constant push. The particle feels that it's being accelerated at a constant rate. That would I would call the constant acceleration. So to find that, we have done this if the particle ki force acceleration a mu hai, to if I go to MCLF, this a mu takes this form. This form. So that the third component is just you please open the mic ban karte is just the acceleration uh, ordinary acceleration and this is true in MCLF. So let's suppose that this ordinary acceleration has its value hai g. And I'm only considering one dimension. So I'm going to draw X and T. So something which moves towards us or move away from us at constant acceleration. So we just saw that it is equal to G square, where G is acceleration in MCLF. But since this is a scalar product, so it does not depend on on the frame, at least not on the uh, initial frames. I can go from one initial frame to another. Another a mu is a well-defined vector, and this does not change. This comes out that I, in my frame, maybe if I write, if I write this vector. So I have a trajectory, some trajectory, and at each point I'm computing a mu. Okay, I will frame maybe compute kanu. I will know that I must get this equal to g square. This defines an object moving with constant acceleration g your value is key acceleration key and it's defined through this equation because when i go to mclf i find out that this kind of uh, trajectory will have uh, in any mclf is acceleration equal to g to this equation So, ab ye kaisi trajectory hogi? So, because of this, I have a set of equations. I have agar main isko open karu, minus a naught square plus a one square. I have only one spatial component is equal to g square. That's my this defining equation. But I also know that I must have that a is orthogonal to u. So a naught, u naught plus a one u one is zero, and I know 
that u1 has u has to be the forward velocity has to be normalized that will ensure that i am taking derivatives with respect to tau and that's what i need that's how i have to find it so i have u naught square plus u1 square is equal to minus 1 so all over here these are the definitions that u mu this will happen if this is true. And this is how it's been parameterized, the two coordinates, x0 and x1, and they fulfill these equations. So we have to find some kind of a curve which fulfills all these three equations. So I can pretty much guess it. So let's assume to fulfill equation one, I can take the and thus I can take uh, a naught is equal to G shine g tau and a1 because i have to parameterize it using tau and there's only one parameter so i have to come up with some functions of tau which when combined in this way in equation one give me g square so this will do the job right because minus a naught square plus a one square gives me g square cosine square g tau minus shine square g tau is equal to g square because this bracket is one. So I can integrate it because I know that this is equal to du naught over d tau and a1 is du1 over d tau so this gives me u naught is equal to cos a naught was shine so its integral is cosh and this g cancels with the g coming from the integral And E1 is integral of cosh, which is shine. C2. Now, I have to satisfy I have to check that it doesn't satisfy this equation, the second equation. So the second equation was a, a1 u1. So this gives me uh, these cross terms. I have g shine g tau cosine g tau minus and plus g cosh g tau shine g tau and then i have these uh, cross terms minus c1 uh, u naught times a naught c1 g shine g tau plus c2 g cosh g tau now these cancel while these i have to satisfy for any tau so that's only possible I have to take c1 c2 equals zero so i don't get anything in the constants 
and u naught is then cosine of d tau and u1 is sine of d tau. Now integrate again. When I integrate again, I get x naught is one over d plus shine. Integral of cosh is shine, but I get a one over g plus some constant. Plus some constant. So it's giving me the coordinates of this particle or this object which is being accelerated at any value of tau. Tau is uh, some time is known as world clock or the length of its world line is giving me the value of uh, my time coordinate at any, every point of tau. And my uh, the, the time coordinate I assign to it and the space coordinate I assign, assign to it any, at any tau on its clock. So it's something like that. And at any tau, I read off according to these equations, what is x naught and what is x one. Now I can, I have these constants a and b, uh, which are arbitrary at this point, but I can just to simplify my equations, I can choose some values for these. So for example, if I assume that at tau is equal to zero, First of all, how does it look like? How does u naught look like? The tau is equal to zero, u naught is one, and u one is zero. So these are the components of a four velocity in inertial frame, in a frame where this particle is stationary, right? Because U has these components. Always. So it will have these components one, zero, only when its velocity of this object in this frame is zero. So that means at tau is equal to zero, it's the, and I'm computing all this, I'm doing all this computation in my frame. So at, at tau is equal to zero, this object is stationary in my frame. So at tau is equal to zero, this guy, this particle and I share the same frame. So at tau is equal to zero, it's stationary in my frame. So it's like the situation because the acceleration is constant, it's reaching me from somewhere far away, constantly slowing down and at tau is equal to zero, the parameterization has been chosen such that at tau is equal to zero, it stops and turns back and starts moving away and gaining speed. So just to simplify things, I put this condition just to choose a constant. At tau is equal to zero, let me adjust my clocks. Let's adjust our clocks. So that at tau is equal to zero, our time is equal to zero as well. So we just adjust our clocks. Then, so that it stops at t is equal to zero in our frame. Then you will have this equation. Uh, then A would be zero. So your equations describing the trajectory would be so then it says that uh, at tau is equal to zero, uh, its clock reads zero, and my clock also reads zero. And 
it's uh, at it's at a distance at tau is equal to zero. For me, its distance is one over g plus b. So its trajectory is something like that. It's moving towards me at t is equal to zero. It stops. Its uh, uh, tangent vector is parallel to my tangent vector, and then it starts gaining speed. First, it was losing the speed, and becomes tangent vector becomes uh, parallel to my tangent vector, and then it starts gaining speed. And it does it. It stops at a distance. One over g plus b from me. But let me simplify it a little bit further, and let's say I adjust my origin so that this b is zero, right? I can start. It's just the zero of my meter stick. I can do it from here. Adjust the origin. Origin of my meter stick. So that b is equal to zero. In other words, from here, you are just doing x minus b is one over g cosh g tau, and you are giving it another name, uh, x tilde, but I'm calling it x. So finally, with these little adjustments, which are just shifting of origin, that where do you start your clock? And where do you put a zero on your meter stick? This is quite general. This would be the trajectory of a particle moving at constant acceleration. So what kind of curve is this? Well, we have actually encountered this curve before, because if I make this combination, it gives me so it's a hyperbola with this and it looks like this. At t is equal to zero, x is equal to g. X is equal to one over g. And goes like this. So what is the speed of this object at any instant? At any instant. So it's dx that means the speed is tangent hyperbolic g of or t. So that's the slope of the tangent. Uh, well, not really slope of the tangent over here. That's the one over, because we are drawing x over here, t over here. Slope of the tangent is one over tangent hyperbolic g over t. Oh. Now, uh, this is the speed, and we can check that as tau goes to plus infinity, so very, very far away in the future, v goes to one. And as tau goes to minus infinity, v goes to minus one. So this object which has been which is being 
accelerate it constantly. You are pushing on it. The object feels a constant push throughout its life, and you can keep pushing for an infinite amount of time with the same weight. And how will you measure the push? The object feels the same push in its MCLF. You can do it for an infinite amount of time, but even then it will not cross the speed of light. It will take it an infinite amount of time, infinite, any amount of force applied for infinite amount of time will only accelerate it to at maximum speed of light. And even that will take infinite amount of time. And since we are considering a constant acceleration, which remains constant throughout, so we are forced to consider in this uh, very special idealized case, an object, this trajectory describes an object which comes in from far away from infinity. And in the very, very far past, it was moving near the speed of light and it was constantly slowing down. And it turns when it's at a distance one over G from us, and then it starts uh, moving away. And finally, uh, in infinite time, it gains speed infinite, uh, equal to speed of light. So this is another proof that you cannot accelerate any object past the speed of light in relativity. But this leads to some very interesting pieces of physics as well, this space-time diagram. So let's draw So these are our coordinates, x, t, our space-time diagram. And this object is 1 over g. By the way, so since because of this condition, I know that dt over dx is one over V, which is equal to plus or minus one as tau goes to infinity. This hyperbola, just as we had discussed before in general, is asymptotic to the light cones. Hyperbola kitne dimension? Two dimensions, man. No, sir. Sorry, Michael. What did you say? Was there a question? No, sir. We were discussing the discussion. Sorry, if the mic was opened, then you would have heard it. Okay. So this hyperbola, and what is this hyperbola? It's describing the trajectory of the object which is moving at constant acceleration. So its shape is fixed, how does it fix? It's a, first of all, it's a hyperbola and it crosses the x-axis at a coordinate one over G and it's asymptotic to the light cones. So that's pretty much describes it. Uh, now you can say something more about this hyperbola. Uh, If I consider this hyperbola, this is its uh, mm, okay. Well, first let me discuss this part. Let me draw it again. And let me first draw the light cones. And this trajectory describes this object. Or well, let's say this is an observer. Yeah, for now, now let's consider this piece of physics. Now this is an observer, which is moving at a constant acceleration. So this guy is put in a rocket, which is always accelerating at a constant acceleration. 
Now, because we know that nothing moves faster than speed of light, we can say something very remarkable about the this this guy. So this part, this line, is dividing this space time into two regions. There is this region inside, and this is outside. And this line has a very interesting property. The property is that if something happens here, or here, or here, or here, anything which happens inside this boundary, the signals from it have to remain within the light cone because nothing moves faster than the light cone, the light. So this signal, since it's parallel to this, this uh, surface, which is actually a uh, light-like surface, or you could say it's a null surface, it's just a light cone, but it's asymptotic to the trajectory of this observer. So this light is parallel to this null surface, or this light-like surface. So it's never going to hit uh, this observer. Similarly, this event, or you can consider an event here. So for this observer, for this guy who is always accelerating, anything beyond this boundary is unobservable. As long as they always remain moving, always keep moving at constant acceleration, nothing beyond this can ever affect them. So this thing can be then given a name, is given a name, this kind of surface in space-time is given a name, it's called uh, event horizon. In this case, it's kind of fake because it exists for this observer as long as uh, there's nothing like inherent in space-time, this event horizon has been created because of the special motion of this object. If it were always moving at constant acceleration, then obviously this will be true for the sky. And uh, they won't be able to be affected. They won't be affected or will never hear anything from beyond the surface. Anything which happens here, there could be some strange creatures living here, fire breathing dragons. They're perfectly fine because they will never hear of them. But if they stop accelerating, so for example, if they stop accelerating at this point, then they will go like that. Then sometime in future, they will hear. And it will not, no longer be uh, an event horizon. In that case, event horizon will be destroyed because they stopped accelerating. But as long as they keep moving with constant acceleration, there's an event horizon. Similarly, this surface, this again divides the space time into two regions. This is, let's say, outside, or maybe let's call it inside, and this outside. This has this property that if you send any signal, if this guy sends any signal, wants to send signals in the space time, they can do it in the past. Suppose they want to send some signal here. They can do it at this point. Send light will reach here. Want to signal here, send light at this point will reach here. Want to send here. A light cone from any event will cross the trajectory of this object at some point. So they're connected with that, at least at some point in their life. So they can affect uh, everything inside this region. They can send signal to by sending it at some appropriate time. But they can never send any signal beyond this boundary because whatever they send remains 
parallel to the surface and never crosses it. So this kind of horizon, well, people give them different name. Sometimes people call it particle horizon. So you cannot affect anything beyond it, beyond this horizon. So you have created these two horizons just by the virtue of moving at a constant acceleration. So any question about it? No, I guess let's stop here because what I'm going to discuss next, probably it would be better if we do it in person. So let's stop here. And is there a question? So any question? No, so then. Is my book uh, mainly refer to? Uh, yeah, I don't know if it's in the shoots, but along this line, at least this accelerated observer has been discussed in a book by Wheeler. That big book by Wheeler. Uh, book okay. Back, gave it. Right, yep. Thanks. Okay.